Well, hello, Ransom Church. It is so good to be with you. Thank you for joining us, whether you're online or in one of our campuses. We are so thankful to be with you this morning. My name is Paul, and before we really dive in, I got to say, please, please mark your calendars, clear your schedules, do whatever you need to do to join us next Sunday for Reset Sunday. In fact, this entire week is Reset Week leading up to Reset Sunday. It is, if you call the Ransom Church your home, or if you consider calling Ransom Church your home, you need to be here next week, whether you join us in person or online. It is going to be an amazing experience to hear uh, what God is doing, where God is taking us, to be able to celebrate baptisms. Uh, In fact, be watching later on in this gathering for a video to share a little bit more about it. But please be sure to join us next week for for Reset Sunday. Uh, Now again, like I said, my name is Paul. I'm excited to be able to actually wrap up this series that we've been in called Be Wise. We've been in this series called Be Wise, looking at wisdom, at, at godly biblical wisdom and what it looks like to apply it to some important things in our lives like money, uh, uh, marriage, family, parenting, those type of relationships. We've looked at how to be wise in each of those areas. And today we get the chance to explore the topic of technology. Technology. I'm talking about phones, internet, TVs, gaming systems, uh, tablets, digital assistants, all those devices and, and objects and systems that so easily captivate us and more and more frequently invade every part of our lives. I think you know exactly what I'm talking about, and you know exactly which objects and and devices and systems specifically apply to you, to your household, to your family. And today we want to explore what it looks like, what it means to be wise when it comes to the technology in our lives. And yes, to answer the question that you probably already have in your head, I am up here to talk about technology because I am the millennial and all the old people on staff were too scared to talk about it, all right? I wrote down old timers, old timers on staff. Mostly kidding. No, but listen, uh, think, about, think about the difference of technology in your lifetime. Doesn't matter how old you are. It is crazy to think about how far technology has come in our lifetimes. That some of those comparisons are pretty obvious, right? You think about a cell phone capable of pretty much anything these days while landlines pretty close to extinct at this point, particularly the the landlines with like the 30 foot, 35 foot long curly corded line that when you went to hang it up, it would freak out and get all twisted up. You remember those? Uh, Maybe just me. Uh, What about computers? Computers would be another example. Um, When I was in elementary school, my family got our first desktop computer and it was huge, bulky, super slow. And now my laptop is is crazy fast and I could probably throw it across this room if I wanted to because it's so light. Uh, And by the way, I can make my laptop work basically anywhere thanks to a hotspot from my phone. And I don't even know what that means, but it works. Uh, And so I can watch Lion King right, wherever I want to, anywhere that I have a cell phone signal. But in seventh grade, I couldn't get on Yahoo Messenger because my mom was waiting for a phone call, right? Anybody with me on that? Um, Listen, it is crazy to think about the change in technology. We're at the point where even refrigerators and washing machines have built-in cameras and internet capabilities. It is crazy. And I'm I'm not gonna pass up the opportunity to throw us all back to a simpler time when we got to hear noises like this. Painful. The good old days, right? Listen, the the pace of change is crazy when it comes to technology, and it makes the conversation as a church really, really interesting, pretty unique, honestly, because if you think about it, the church, the big C church, has had thousands of years to to dissect scripture and to, to build up this trove of wisdom on how to handle things like money with wisdom. And yet we've had about five minutes to think about how to handle smartphones with wisdom. Author Andy Crouch wrote a book called The TechWise Family. I would highly recommend it. Uh, But he puts it this way. He says, when previous generations confronted the perplexing challenges of parenting and family life, they could fall back on wisdom that had been handed down for generations. But the pace of technological change has surpassed anyone's capacity to develop enough wisdom to handle it. We are stuffing our lives with technology's new promises with no clear sense of whether technology will help us keep the promises we've already made. Technology has invaded pretty much every single part of our lives, the church included. But what's scary to me is that very few of us have actually stopped long enough to ask, I wonder what God thinks 
about this. I wonder how God would want me to use this. As we've been looking at the last few weeks, wisdom, biblical, godly wisdom is all about seeking out what God wants for our lives and being brave enough to apply it. Ephesians 5 talks about wisdom like this. It says, so be careful then how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Let me put it this way. We will never be wise with something until we ask God what he wants us to do with it. We'll never be wise with our our money until we stop and ask God, how do you want me to handle this money? We won't be wise with our relationships or, or jobs or opportunities in our lives until we stop long enough for God to show us his desire for it. And the same applies to technology. But most of us, and I would honestly include myself in this, really haven't stopped long enough to ask God, what do you think about this? This thing in my life, what do you think about it? So this morning, I want to do something a little bit different. Instead of giving you a bunch of answers, I want to ask a bunch of questions. I want to ask a bunch of tough questions to get our minds thinking on technology and wisdom. In fact, I want to ask some tough questions about technology. I want to pick on technology a little bit, put it on the interrogation seat, because as Jesus followers, we cannot afford to be fools with technology. At the rate that it is dominating our worlds and our lives, we have to, as that verse says, make the most of every opportunity, not act thoughtlessly, and understand what the Lord wants us to do. Now, before we dive into this and ask these tough questions, let me be clear right at the beginning. I am not against technology. I have an iPhone. It's a little older, but it's still pretty smart. I I wrote and researched basically this entire thing on my laptop. Uh, At home, we have an iPad. We have a smart TV. We have an Alexa that we really only use to ask stupid questions, but we have it around. Um, I'm not anti-technology at all. And honestly, I'm asking these questions as much for myself as for anyone else. And as a church, clearly we are not anti-technology. You're either watching this right now on, on a laptop on a TV, on a phone, or maybe you're at one of our campuses watching through, through the live stream on one of the big screens, or you're in the same room as me and you're still watching the big screens because you get in the habit of it. I do it too, right? Listen, we have an online campus. We have a website. We have social media accounts. We text you. We email you. You know why? Because that's what you use. We are in no way anti-technology, so these questions apply to us as well. So we want to stop for a moment today and really make sure the conversation gets going so we can ask what God thinks about all of this stuff. And honestly, we may not even come up to solid answers. It may take you lots of time to, to, to think about this for yourself and to ask these questions, but we absolutely need to start the conversation. And we're gonna be all over scripture today so you can follow along on the screens as we ask these tough questions and check how tech-wise we really are. So let's dive in. The first tough question, the tough question that I want to ask regarding technology is this. Is technology in your life making you more or less distracted? Is the technology in your life and the way you use it making you more or less distracted? Now, I know this doesn't apply to anybody in here or anybody watching, but there is a treasure trove of funny YouTube videos of people uh, texting and walking into doors, right? Walking into walls, walking into other people, the scary ones or when they start to walk into traffic, right? There's, there's plenty of those funny stories, but I'm actually talking about a little bit deeper kind of distraction. Luke 10, Jesus has an interaction with two sisters that kind of starts to get to this. Luke 10, starting in verse 38, says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, They came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. Now, life is full of distractions, full of distractions that threaten to pull us away from the feet of Jesus. And some of those distractions are absolutely negative. Most of them are probably neutral. Some might even seem positive as the story of Mary and Martha shows us. But whatever they are, those distractions can slowly chip away at our relationship with Jesus and cause us to drift further and further from him. 
And long before Apple and Microsoft took over our lives, Jesus warned us about the danger of distraction. He once told a story about a farmer scattering seed, and there were many different outcomes of the seed that was scattered, but I want to pick out a single thread. So follow along with me on the screen as I read through these verses out of Luke 8. It says, One day Jesus told a story in the form of a parable to a large crowd that had gathered from many towns to hear him. Jesus said, A farmer went out to plant his seed. Some seed fell among thorns that grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. Jesus replied, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And so they never grow into maturity. Technology makes so many things in our life easier for us, but it has done nothing to make our lives less busy or less distracted. In fact, more often than not, it simply multiplies the distractions in our lives. Have you ever sat down to read your Bible and and, and immediately heard the, the ding of your phone? Have you ever tried to engage in prayer and found yourself having a hard time tuning out the the TV or the music playing in the background? For many of us, hearing God's voice is, is hard enough as it is because we never actually stop long enough to listen. But even in those rare moments of stillness, the technology in our lives keeps us distracted mentally and spiritually long enough to miss what God wants to say to us. And we miss the seed of God's word because the weeds and thorns of life's distractions get in the way. So again, when it comes to the technology in your life, is it making you more distracted or less? It's a tough question for sure, and it's one that you're gonna have to wrestle through more later on your own. So let's dive in with another one, another tough question. Does technology make you more or less anxious? Does the way you use technology make you more or less anxious? Now, obviously, we are in the midst of of unique cultural circumstances right now, right? I mean, who's sick of the phrase unprecedented times? Just me? Uh, Listen, even before COVID, though, anxiety and depression were at all-time highs. Can you imagine where they are right now? And the access to information that we all have thanks to technology can be an enormous blessing to us, but... It also means that our fragile hearts and our fragile minds are exposed to so much negative information. Not only do we get to worry about our own issues, our own problems in our life, now we have the opportunity to be anxious about things happening all over the world. We get to stress out about elections happening in countries that we can't even pronounce. We get to worry about weather happening somewhere where we will never visit. We have our hearts broken because of the terrible things people experience somewhere else. And it just gets to be so much. And I'm not advocating that you be blind, that you put on blinders and you don't know about these things. But I wish that I could say our natural tendency is to see the problems of this world and lean more into God. But I'm just not sure that's the case. I think for most of us, we get more and more overwhelmed by all the brokenness we see. And we end up trusting God less and less. Compare that with what Philippians 4 says. In the ESV, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God wants us to draw close to him, to let his peace rule in our lives. But too often, instead of letting God's peace guard our hearts and minds, the way we use technology to gather more and more negative information leads us to end up being more and more anxious and less and less trusting. We have to ask ourselves, is the way we're using technology making us more or less anxious? Does it make you trust God more or less? Let's do another one. This is another tough question and maybe honestly one that that few of us have really thought of before. Does technology help you rest and work better or worse? 
Does the way you use technology help you rest and work better or worse? Right at the beginning of the Bible, and honestly, at the, at the beginning of humanity itself, God established a couple things that remain true for us to this day. We need meaningful work, and we need genuine rest. And as a church, we've talked before about work and how work itself is not something necessarily to avoid, but honestly, it's an opportunity to be creative, to help sustain, to, to gain fulfillment, to have purpose. And we've also talked about how frail we are physically, emotionally, spiritually. We are designed to need times of true Sabbath-type rest. Out of the entire Bible, the second chapter, the second chapter of Genesis uh, establishes both of these things. In Genesis 2.15, it says, The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. The ESV says to work it and to keep it. In Genesis 2.3, says, God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. And we see in the Ten Commandments that God uh, commands his people to honor and observe the Sabbath. Andy Crouch in the TechWise family sums it up this way. He says, we are meant to work, but we are also meant to rest. This pattern is fundamental to human flourishing and to the flourishing of the whole world that depends on our care. But it has been disrupted and distorted by human greed and sloth. Instead of work and rest, we have ended up with toil and leisure. And neither one is an improvement. And strangely enough, technology, which promised to make work easier and rest more enjoyable, often has exactly the opposite effect. We understand this idea, don't we? I mean, how often has technology robbed us of a restful day? Maybe it's just me, but I have had plenty of days off that I spent binging Netflix or, or playing games or scrolling through my phone. And even though I barely rolled off the couch, I wake up the next day far more tired than I was before. See, we end up trading rest for leisure, and we end up walking away more spiritually drained than we were before. And regardless of our career, regardless of our job status, we assume that technology makes our jobs easier, and we also assume it makes our, our chores, our household tasks easier, maybe takes them away completely. And therefore, we'll have more time and energy for things that give us life. Is that true for you? Did buying that Roomba translate to more time spent with your kids? Maybe. But for too many of us, that just has not been the case. And technology itself is not the culprit, but for the sake of our souls, we need to start using it with intentionality. And it starts with honestly asking ourselves and answering the question, does technology help us rest and work better or worse? All right, time for another tough question. And we've had some tough ones already, but this is honestly one that most of us would probably rather avoid altogether. Does technology bring you more temptation or less? Does technology bring you more temptation or less? Honestly, this is a question that I don't even want to ask. But church, we cannot afford to avoid this conversation. And when we talk about temptation and we talk about temptation that leads to sin, we're talking about choosing things for our life outside of what God wants for us. And this sin is something that you can read about all over the Bible and get, it, get this clear picture of what it means. But way back at the very beginning, God has this conversation with a, a, a brother named Cain who's angry at his brother Abel. And he's tempted to make a bad choice. And God warns him, watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. And that was true for Cain then, and it's true for us now. Sin is crouching in our life around every corner, eager to control us. And the reality is that the sinfulness and the temptation that we struggle with doesn't actually have anything to do with technology. Before there were screens, there was still sin, lots of it. You don't need an internet connection to struggle with lust. You don't need online games to, to struggle with gambling. You don't need a Facebook account to struggle with anger or gossip. Technology does not cause you to sin, but it sure gives you plenty of opportunities, doesn't it? Right now in your pocket, and on an average of about six or seven devices per household in the United States, you have instant access to infinite opportunities to entangle yourself in sin. 
In fact, we need to say it out loud right now. There is a porn epidemic going on in our world today. And maybe you have never been told this, but consuming porn is sin. It's not what God wants for you or your life. Porn hurts you by completely distorting your image of sex and by pulling you further from God and from other people. And it also feeds some pretty awful things in our world like sex trafficking, slavery, and domestic violence. Porn is not okay. If it's something that you struggle with, you need to ask for help. You need to reach out to a pastor or talk to somebody that you trust in your life. You can't say it's not hurting anybody. It is. But listen, there is freedom in Jesus, and God has more for you. In fact, here at The Ransom, we have ministries that can help you with this. So if this is something you struggle with, you need to reach out. But church, porn is not the only temptation that technology offers us. You need to think about your life and think about uh, the things that you consume. Think about your social media feed. Think about your guilty pleasure TV show. Think about your, your favorite video game. These things that we consume, these things we take in, shape the way that we think, the way that we talk, the way we act. They shape the decisions that we make. We need to critically ask ourselves, is technology helping me look more like Jesus or not? Is it helping me live more free of sin or not? Colossians 3 says, So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you've stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. We were made to live free of sin. And listen, we won't be all that God made us to be until we start to allow Jesus to disentangle us from the sin that holds us back. And sometimes that requires making hard decisions, hard choices in our lives. And it always requires us to be honest with ourselves and to submit every part of our life to God, technology included. And technology itself is not bad, but right now it is an especially easy and accessible avenue for so much temptation in our lives. So again, does the way you use technology tempt you to sin more or less? Before we continue on to the next tough question, let me share a a kind of funny story with you. A couple years ago, I was with some friends out in Rapid City, South Dakota, and we were having dinner. We were out at a restaurant, and we had ordered our food, and our food had come to our table. Uh, And before we actually ate our meal, we, we stopped, and we bowed our heads, and we were praying before the meal. And so we were all sitting there with our heads bowed and and praying, and the waiter came up and and started to talk to us, started to ask us some questions, and one of our group was polite, and he looked up and and started to answer him, and and the the waiter, once he realized what was happening, he he was mortified. He was so apologetic. He kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and I'll never forget this. He said, I'm so sorry. I had no idea you were praying. I just assumed you were on your phones texting each other, which brings me to my next question. Is technology bringing you into more community or less? Community. One of the most ironic aspects of technology is the way that it has pretty much failed miserably at connecting people in meaningful ways. Now, let me be fair and say that I know many, many amazing couples that were brought together by a dating app. And I know how communication technology has helped uh, forge and grow and sustain relationships all over the place. And I know that for me personally, technology has helped every single one of my relationships because I would not know a single person's birthday without Facebook. (laughs) Family included. I'm sorry, uh, but it's true. But listen, a growing stack of scientific research is showing how technology actually tends to isolate us more than ever. 
And technology actually seems to be decreasing our ability to engage with other people in a healthy and meaningful way. That's a huge deal, people. Not just for our own health and well-being, but for the health and well-being of the church. Hebrews 10 says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. In several places in the Bible, we see that the the gathering of believers is described as a body, a body of many parts that work together. And if the parts of the body are unable to meaningfully relate to one another, if they're unable to work together or, or communicate in a healthy way, if the parts of the body can't help and motivate each other, then we will always be stuck spinning our wheels and falling short of what God wants for us. Like it or not, we need each other. And we need each other fully, not just superficially. We were designed for radical community. But more often than not, the way we use technology actually hinders community instead of helping it. We have to ask ourselves, is technology bringing us into more community, more genuine biblical community, or less? One more tough question for this morning. And this is the last tough question, but honestly, it could be the most relevant for us today. Is technology causing more division in your life or less? Is technology and the way you use it causing more division in your life or less? Again, this may seem fairly obvious with a a presidential election coming up, with with schools getting started and conversations about masks ongoing, so many things. This question is probably more relevant than other. And I don't fully understand what it is about technology that can, it turns the person with the sweetest disposition into a full-on rage monster internet troll. And I don't fully understand it, but it seems like every passing day, technology gives us opportunities to dig our trenches even deeper and hurl more and more destructive grenades to people who think differently than we do. We may start out with great intentions, but listen, caps lock and the share button have caused more division between people than any face-to-face disagreement I've ever seen. And I don't care what you believe, this applies to your group. So what does God's word say about division. Galatians 5, starting in verse 14, says, For the whole law can be summed up in this one command love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. And ahead to verse 24 says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Technology is not the source of any division in our world today. But by and large, we have used technology as a weapon. And I wish I could say the church is exempt from this conversation, but it's not. We have used technology, all of us individually and and in our different groups, we have used technology to create echo chambers for our own biases. We've used it to spread lies and slander about other people. We've used it to demean and, and belittle and bully those who think differently than us. And all of it is leading to deeper and deeper division, which often means less and less spiritual influence. If we claim Christ, why in the world would we post or share hateful messages about other people? Why would we promote and celebrate news media that tears people down who think differently than them? If we want the chance to introduce people to Jesus, we can't afford to use technology in a way that alienates anybody who believes a little differently than us. Church, we have to ask ourselves, is technology, is the way I use technology causing more division in my life or less? 
Now, before we turn it over to the campuses, I understand that, that all of these questions and, and honestly, maybe some of the early thoughts that you have in your head, they might feel a little depressing, maybe even frustrating, because right now you're thinking about how, how unrealistic and, and unreasonable and, and maybe even hypocritical these questions are. And you might be tempted to think that there's really only two options out there. Either you reject technology altogether and move to Amish country, or you just ignore this conversation altogether because it's too hard to sort out. And so you'll carry on using technology like the rest of the world while you put your faith in a separate box. But I'm here to tell you there is good news because there is a third option. We don't have to reject technology altogether. Neither do we have to just give up and receive it wholeheartedly. Instead, we can choose to redeem it. Listen, every single danger that technology presents can be redeemed. It can be redeemed. We don't just have to outright reject technology. We simply have to submit it to God and use it with purpose. We don't just have to, to receive it and hope for the best. We can let God guide us and use it for good. And when we let the spirit within us speak to us in God's wisdom about technology, it can go from a dangerous weapon to one of the most beautiful, useful tools we could ever imagine. We have seen technology help people worship free of inhibition in so many ways. Particularly right now in a season where physical gathering has been a challenge, we have seen thousands of people have an opportunity to connect and worship together thanks to technology. We've seen community groups and discipleship relationships unleash technology as a tool to more effectively pursue a life free of sin. We've seen you as the church Use your social media and your devices to, to serve and love your neighbors, to, to support global mission efforts, to promote justice and peace and love. Technology can be a dangerous weapon, absolutely, but it can also be a beautiful tool for God's kingdom work right here and right now if we choose to redeem it. As a church, we're not going to approach technology with fear. We're not going to just choose to reject it. We're not going to choose to just receive it wholeheartedly. We're going to choose to submit technology to the Lord, to seek his wisdom in it, to let it be leveraged for his purposes in any way we can. We're going to choose to redeem it. We serve a God that is powerful enough to redeem the most broken and dangerous things in this world for his purpose and his glory. And I know that's true for technology technology because I know it's true for you and I know it's true for me. Ransom Church, being tech wise, being wise with technology is not about a digital fast. It's not about deleting all your accounts. It's not about unplugging your internet. It's about asking the tough questions. It's about having the conversations that need to be had. It's about carving out space for God to give us an answer. And it's about being brave enough to say yes to whatever he's calling us to do. So be careful then how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. We just put technology on trial. It's in the hot seat. The light is on it. Um, and we want this to be a launching pad for you to take this into your home, to put them on trial. Is technology making you more or less anxious? Answer it truthfully. We want to see light. We want to see the light in the world, and we have the opportunity to do that through technology. And we believe that when you submit it to him, he can restore that to be accountable in whatever that looks like. Whether there's struggles with porn, what does it look like for accountability in that? There is tools for that. We want to talk to you about that. So like I said, let this be a launch pad. Put it on trial. Have the conversations. There is so much that is happening. We want to dig deeper. On Wednesdays, we, we do a thing called Dig Deeper Online to go deeper into what is being said today. We'd love for you to join us. And throughout this whole week, 
We have some new stuff coming that was talked about earlier about a reset Sunday. And we want you to plug in with that and follow us along on social media as we get ready to that. And we just want to give you a sneak peek of what that will look like. Church, I want to talk to you about an exciting week that is about to unfold as we talk about coming back for the fall and getting ready to to re-engage in everything that Ransom does what we're realizing is that a restart is not enough what we need is a reset the world has changed uh, everything has kind of shifted and if, if we're gonna know what setting captives free means in this new world if we're gonna know what worship free live free serve free means in this new world it's gonna take a divine reset And so we're gonna want you to tune in all throughout this week you're gonna see videos that are gonna be on social media about all of our different ministries and what this reset is gonna look like for them and then next Sunday you're gonna to want to join us for sure uh, actually whole all of next weekend you're gonna to want to join us for sure on Friday the 28th we're having a worship night that you're not gonna to want to miss and then on Sunday the 30th it's reset Sunday and you're gonna to get to hear about everything at Ransom and what it looks like for it to be reset including how we look you're not gonna to want to miss that so join us check it out all week and then we'll see you Sunday <laughs>